And we're live. We're Hi, live. everybody. <laughs> Hello. We Can have two hi. special guests tonight. <laughs> say hi to YouTube. You're going to shrink out of here? <laughs> right. Well, that was anticlimactic. <laughs> it was anticlimactic. But here's the thing. Is this is my daughter, Maggie. <laughs> and she loves YouTube. And we also, we like going out at night too, right? And I want my own YouTube channel. Yeah, she wants her own YouTube channel like we have. So, what, um, but when we go out at night, there's some things that you've learned. Like, how do you find the North Star? Um, uh, you, um, you, you, when you find the Big Dipper, the last two stars <coughs> point to the North Star. That's right. That was a good job. Um, and the North Star is pretty important, right? But it's not the brightest yeah. star in the sky. What's the brightest star? Jupiter. Jupiter. Is Jupiter a star, though? Um, no. No? How do you tell the difference between a star and a, uh, and a planet? Um, a star twinkles and a planet glows. Yeah, that's good. So we got to get outside and look at the North Star again. Yeah. Okay. You want to say goodbye? Come on, say goodbye to everybody on YouTube. <laughs> okay. I'll see you later. <laughs> All right. Nice. Product endorsement. Nice. nice. Go ahead, sweetie. I'll see you later. <laughs> get this, is a, this is a family show. <laughs> well, it okay. must be Tuesday. You have another... <laughs> Welcome, Chris. Good to see you, Thank man. You. you too, Matt. Hey, you've been traveling a bit, haven't you? I have. I just did back-to-back uh, -back workshops. Um, well, I had four days off in between, but uh, we did Yellowstone um, in mid-September, and then uh, I was home for four days and uh, went right back out to Colorado, um, where we had just beautiful aspens and beautiful nights. Uh -huh. It was five straight nights of just perfectly clear conditions. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, we had a lot of fun. It was great. That's amazing. Welcome back. It's good to, good to have you back. Even if you're muted. Oh, hey. <laughs> All right. Well, I understand there's atmospheric conditions and you know, what's going on right now is completely topical because, you know, um, what, the thing that you wrote your blog post about two weeks ago was, mm -hmm. was how to embrace what could be, uh, viewed as adversity or you know you know things that you didn't exactly plan for happening you know like yeah. somebody jumping into your room and and saying stuff and you know yeah like, <laughs> yeah so i think it's it's right on topic right yeah you just roll with things right right <laughs> um, but, yeah you know the blog posts uh, in particular was about light pollution um, which was a three-part series that we did um, you started it off by writing about light pollution filters and uh, Lance wrote a great post on uh, dealing with light pollution with post-production. Um, but I thought it was really important to, to bring up another way. You know, we, we don't necessarily have to solve for light pollution um, because we can also use it. Um, and, and I think that's a, an important thing to remember in general with photography um, is that adverse conditions don't always mean that you need some uh, a technological solution um, or a solution at all. Um, you can, you know, instead of trying to avoid problems, you can embrace them and try to use them creatively. Uh, so, you know, that was sort of the, the overall point of the blog post. Uh, but again, we were dealing with sp specifically with light pollution. Right. And this is a conversation we've had over and over. Oh, yeah. You know, I guess on, on an almost weekly basis, but specifically on, on workshops when we're looking at images and talking about circumstances, you know, amongst ourselves and with uh, yeah. attendees. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a question we get all the time, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I kind of liken it to, uh, you know, sometimes photographers, usually more beginning photographers, uh, don't want to shoot in bad weather, right? Because, right. oh, it's raining or, oh, it's cloudy. And I say, in fact, I, this is the story that you've probably heard me tell before. A few years ago, I saw a photographer friend on Facebook who lives in Florida um, and it was like mid morning on a Saturday. And he said, oh, I went out this morning to shoot, but it was foggy. So I came home. I'm like, no, 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 you got to go shoot. Right. Because I mean, that the the um, uh, the cliche is that 
bad weather makes for good photography, right? So, you know, as you get more into photography, um, you, you learn these things, right? You learn, you learn that um, adverse conditions are, aren't a reason to avoid going out and shooting. Uh, you, you just have to learn how to work with them to create images that you can't create otherwise. Absolutely. I, I think this is a this is a good point. I would, I think there's going to be a lively discussion tonight, so I just want to kick it off with all okay. of the people that are watching right now, which is there's a lot of the stalwarts here. Um, in the chat, please let us know uh, of some conditions that uh, that you found not ideal, and not whether you could, you conquered them or not. But tell us about situations or you know atmospheric conditions or something where you're just like gosh this is not what i was looking for so tell us some stories in in the chat we'd love to see it yeah uh, but chris you had a couple of really great examples in your blog post and uh, i i think i want to run over to that okay. and oh gosh i just i love this image though wow oh, oh right yeah <laughs> Wow. Yeah, we get we get down to that one later. Yeah, yeah. Um, wow. But, uh, thanks. Wow. Um, yeah. So I, I mean, it's like I, the the part I want to add at the beginning here, and this is definitely part of the discussions that we had, which is um, I'll I'll pose it to the audience a, a different way, and in, in my experience, and this is how I've internalized it in my life, is that you can look at boundaries as advantages instead like okay if that's something i can't change mm -hmm. then how can i turn it into something that i can harness uh, or view as or just believe is a, is a positive aspect um and make it part of what i'm doing how can i turn it into something that becomes a feature instead yeah. of something and i'm just like yeah yeah no. Yeah, and it's a good creative exercise in general. Um, you know, the longer you do photography, the more you find yourself in in ruts. And uh, sometimes those those ruts are maybe think of them as a creative plateau where you go a while without getting better. Um, it, it, one of the things that causes that is by falling into the habits of always working in the same rules. And they might be rules that we've developed for ourselves, which is part of how you develop a style too. Uh, so there's a good part of that, um, but you, you, you know it's good to be aware of the rules and the boundaries, as you, as you said, and and break them when it can help you, um, and, and that's a large part of what this this post was about. Uh, and again, dealing specifically with light pollution, but I, I think it's an important thing creatively to keep in mind, uh, you know, during artistic growth. Right. So you, your first suggestion was to backlight the horizon. Yeah, that's, um, you know, so kind of the, the overall premise is, in, again, instead of avoiding light pollution, how can we use it to make an image better? Uh, or more accurately, to create an image that we couldn't have created without it. Because, um, yeah, you know, there's a couple of maybe more obvious ways to deal with light pollution creatively that I didn't mention. I, I, and I thought about it. Like one thing is if you're facing east of this light pollution and you don't like it, well, maybe just face west, right? Um, that's obvious. Uh, there's also, you know, you could shoot black and white. If the light pollution is causing color casts that you don't like, then, you know, you can shoot black and white, um, which is something that I know Lance is going to write a blog post about at some point. So I kind of didn't want to get into that. Um, but again, like, I just wanted to focus on what are some ways that you can use light pollution to help an image um, that might not have been as good without it. And the first thing that I, I thought of, because it's something I, I come across a lot, is that it can help to define a horizon, uh, especially if a horizon is interesting, uh, like this photo from Rocky Mountain National Park. So I was like way up in the tundra. I'm like over 12,000 feet when I'm shooting this. Um, and this is this amazing Milky Way. I mean, in the thin air up there, it's like you feel like you can reach up and touch it. Um, it's just so vivid. Um, you know, but one of the things that is, it, it might not be apparent if you're not thinking about it, uh, but that's light pollution in the background. That's Denver. And without that light pollution there, um, the the mountains on, on the horizon could have gotten lost against a, a darker sky. Um, so, you know, no sky is completely dark. You know, you would have seen it a little bit, 
But in this case, you know, be, because the mountains are such a, divine, a defining aspect of the environment there, uh, it's important to be able to see them. And, in, and this is a case where having something in the background, which was light pollution, uh, helped with that. It helped provide the context uh, for this image. You know, I was really um, disappointed when we went to Rocky Mountain and I didn't see this scene. <laughs> <laughs> I love this picture so much yeah. <laughs> that, that when I didn't get to see something similar with my eyes that was yeah. like this, I was just like, well, there's a lot of beautiful stuff around here, but I really wanted to see that. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, we were there at a slightly different time of year, yeah. and when you and I were there alone, you were primarily fighting the wind and holding your tripod down with all your weight. <laughs> right. So maybe right. you just missed it. But no, no, yeah. you're right. Um, uh, we were there at a different time of year, like three months later into Milky yeah. Way season. Um, but you're right. I mean, that that's the kind of thing that you're not really seeing with the naked eye. The, the light pollution is there. Uh, sometimes light pollution is very apparent to the naked eye, and sometimes it, it just builds up over the course of a long exposure. That's how we usually see it, right? I mean, yeah. kind of like the Milky Way, too. Right? The, the Milky Way isn't quite as vivid to the naked eye as it is to a camera after 20 seconds. Um, One could argue that the Milky Way is light pollution. Yes, you could. <laughs> I wonder what Jerry would have to say about that. <laughs> Jerry had this comment. Okay. <laughs> Jupiter is a failed star. <laughs> failed star. <laughs> I'll, uh, yeah, I'll have a conversation with my seven-year-old about that. And, uh... Uh, your, your next suggestion was to silhouette a subject. Right. So just like we're, you know, we can use light pollution to backlight um, a horizon, uh, we can also use it to backlight a, a subject that's closer to the camera. And um, so this, this photo from Borrego Springs is, is one that came to mind immediately. Um, it, it, Borrego Springs is fantastic for, for shooting. You know, the, the sculptures in the desert are, um, they're just interesting. It sounds trite. I mean, they're just like, there's over a hundred of these things and there's so much you can do with them creatively. So Borrego Springs itself uh, is a dark sky community. Um, but just because that's dark sky community doesn't mean that the next one over is, and it's not. And uh, I, I don't know the name of that town that's in the background, but um, you know, when you're facing that horizon, it, it's there that there's that glow uh, on the horizon, and you can see that with the naked eye. Um, you know, but uh, again, just thinking about how you can be creative. Um, you know, I, I noticed in long exposures how it kind of created this almost sunset like glow. And, uh, and again, I, I knew that that's something that I could silhouette an object in front of. Uh, so I, I thought these two sculptures of the, um, of the bighorn sheep uh, would, would look nice. You know, they're very, whenever you're silhouetting something, you kind of want it to be uh, something with a distinct shape. Um, otherwise, the silhouette's just kind of boring. But this was definitely a distinct shape. And I kind of liked the juxtaposition, too, of the star trails um, with this, what looks like frozen action. So there's almost like a visual mystery to this, right? Where you, you might first, upon first seeing it, think that, oh, it's a wildlife shot. Um, but then you realize that, you no, know, there's star trails that had to be like a 15 minute exposure and those, those can't be real animals, right? Uh, so I kind of like that too. Uh, but none of that would have come together without that light pollution in the background or something in the background lighting it. So I, I could have gone and added light. You know, I could have gone back there with Lux the Viola and um, thrown some light in the background and silhouetted the animals that, that way. But I really like how this turned out with just the whole horizon uh, lit up back there. And, and again, because it's not that bright to the naked eye. It's there. You can see it. But uh, we were also able to see stars. So you get the star trails, too, um, that are building up as well as the light pollution and building up. Uh, during the exposure and this was uh, i think it was a 16 minute exposure <laughs> that's funny i just took the ticker <laughs> off yeah 16 minutes oh uh, 16 I, minutes there we go <laughs> i i love the the gradient in this one the gradient of color that goes from human light emission to astral mm -hmm. light emission it's just a beautiful blend of color from horizon to deep sky oh thanks 
yeah. yeah. And that's a good point, too, uh, just in terms of composition is, uh, you know, how that uh, gradient of color helps draw the eye uh, to where you want it. You know, whenever you're doing silhouettes, you usually want the silhouette to be against something brighter in the scene to create that point of highest contrast because uh, that helps draw the eye to it. Um, so, yeah, that's a, that's a good observation. A question I didn't ask you when I first saw this is, did you hunker down? Did you drop your tripod down to get as much of them above the horizon as possible? Yeah, yeah, I did. The, the tripod's right on the ground, um, mm. you know, completely spread out flat um, for exactly the reason that, that you mentioned. Uh, and if I was up at eye level, would have lost a lot of the shape of the, the sculptures. Got it. Got it. Oh, it's beautiful. Well, we, we got, um, we have a lively... Uh, a lively set of questions here. We posted a question earlier about what people don't like or some boundaries that they've they've hit before. So mm -hmm. let's roll through a couple of those. Jay had low clouds or haze on the horizon. It's prevalent in the Bahamas due to the islands just over the horizon. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I can see that, you know. Um, you know, not being there, I can't say. Ex it's, it's really easy to say, oh, I would do this when you're sitting 2,000 miles away. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, that, that I mean, that's tough because if you're trying to shoot landscape, then, you know, you're losing the stars that are right in that field of view. So, you know, in those cases, I'd probably look for things to aim the camera up at because uh, if the star is higher in the sky, um, then you get down at a lower angle and get those in the background. And again, that can force you into some compositions you might not otherwise think. Right. Uh, the next, the next question or actually comment that we had was from Paul. Um, I went hey, to the Paul. fire. Uh, hi, Paul. How you doing? Uh, I went to the Fire Island workshop. First night was heavy fog, and I decided to go to the hotel. I was amazed as Gabe showed us how he created the lighthouse photo, um, which is this. Yes. Yeah. You know, and that is a great example of of, of the you know, sort of the overarching theme. Um, uh, this isn't about light pollution in particular, but it is about dealing with adverse conditions. So yeah. when we did that summit, um, you know, the New York Night Photography Summit, we went out shooting two nights and there were two different groups uh, right. that went to Fire Island. And that first night we went out, it, it was drizzly and foggy and um, people were disappointed that, you know, the stars weren't out. Uh, you know, but we did it anyway and everybody shot and, you know, Gabe shot this photo and a lot of people had photos like this. And then the next night, the second group that, that so they saw the photos during the day and then were disappointed that they didn't have fog on the second night. Um, you know, they got the starry skies and like, oh, I kind of wanted fog so we could do all those great photos we saw from last night. Right. Uh, you know, and it, and it just goes to show you, like that's happened to me too on some photo trips uh, that have started in rainy weather, and I'm like, oh, I can't believe it's raining, and well, then I spend the rest the rest of the week thinking, oh, I wish it was raining again because <laughs> I shot so many good photos that first day. Yep, and we we have other people that agree. Uh, low clouds are a great time to shoot in the city at night. Yeah, totally yeah. agree with that. Get some color in the sky. Yeah, because when you're shooting it, you know, urban. There's too much light around. You're not seeing the stars anyway, and you end up with just a black sky, but there's some clouds, and you get something going on in the background. It's yep. a great point. Yep. And I, I do love haze or clouds because they do catch that light pollution, which, you yeah. know, like it's it's a nice place to, to scatter that light because it's scattering and reflecting through the, the moisture that's in the air. Um, and then we have one more comment from Sue. I left the house with clearing skies to shoot meteors only to find clouds. How many times in my life have I had that story? <laughs> Learn to be mobile and try elsewhere. Yes. Third try is a charm. Be it clear skies or clouds. Practice light painting. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, absolutely. If you can't work globally, work locally. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, awesome. It brings up a good point about the light painting, too. Um, if you've got clouds uh, that are picking up the uh you know they're picking up the light pollution uh it's a great opportunity to get out and do some light painting uh, and we're going to see an example of that a great photo by tim uh, that's later on in the blog post right well your, your next one is still a silhouette right uh, uh yeah pretty much and i i was in joshua tree shooting with lance um and uh we had this issue we you know we had picked a spot to shoot for the night 
that was kind of close to the the main road in the park and um it it turned out that it was busier than usual because it was a music festival in the area and i think it was a friday night and so cars just kept coming through and um you know at first i was trying to time my photos for when there was no car coming up because i i could see it you know probably about five minutes before it, it got to a spot where it was uh, throwing light into the area that we were shooting um i mean it's the desert you know i could see that car way down the road and so at first I was trying to avoid it, but then I remember, I really vividly remember this moment when I noticed that as the car was coming around this bend uh, to, you know, at the point where it was starting to light pollute the scene, uh, it was all the, you know, those headlights that were backlighting all the dust in the air. And um, I realized how much that was adding to the atmosphere. Uh, and it was also lighting, you know, it was backlighting the rocks and it was backlighting the trees. And I just thought this was incredible. I was like, you know, this is, I, I love adding backlight to a scene, but a car from a quarter mile away backlighting an entire scene at once. I mean, that would be so much work to do myself, but here, here, this car was just doing it for me. So instead I, I completely changed my strategy and I set up a composition with um, the road directly behind it and then waited for cars to come and backlight the scene. Um, so again, it's just embracing a problem and turning it into an opportunity. Love it. We, we have a comment from Peoria vid videos. I like the little mountain or rock outcropping on the left. Adds a lot to the photo. I agree. Yeah. And that was one of the things I, I saw. I mean, that was pretty far in the background. Um, I mean, far enough so that there's no way I could have, done this light painting on my own, uh, at least not for a star point photo. Um, it, you know, that was probably about an eighth of a mile uh, back in the scene. Um, you know, in order to reproduce this, just walking around with a flashlight, it, it probably would have been a, a 20 to 30 minute light painting job. Right. Um, so, but yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that that rock in the background is, is key to the composition and I wouldn't have been able to pull this off without the car. Yeah, it's it's amazing. It's it's a, I I love I've heard this story a couple times before, and I I just I imagine that, that when I get back to Joshua Tree, fingers crossed, next year, <laughs> that it, that I'll be like, hey, this is this is where Chris did the thing, and he, you know, I I'm pretty sure that that's what I'll do. You know, like yeah, I mean, it's a great idea, and I'm totally gonna steal it. That's all I'm saying. So I, I'm sure that you're gonna bring a whole different take to it too. I'm still gonna steal it. <laughs> yeah, there, go ahead. Yeah. In fact, I could, if I would, uh, my guess is that if you were there, uh, just knowing your style, you probably would have found a way to include the car trails as well. I'm pretty sure I would. Yeah. That's, that's a good, <laughs> that's a good observation. Yeah. I probably would have, you know, stuck swords and light tubes all over the car too. <laughs> <laughs> Was your hands that got cold? Oh, yeah. 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 Some of you might know those. Oh, this is great. We had, um, I, there was a comment that I, I missed and I'm going to ask, this is out of the blue. It's a left-handed one, or okay. I mean, uh, are we going back to Borrego Springs? I would say we're definitely going back to Borrego Springs at some point. Um, there, you know, we don't have it on the schedule right now, but, uh, there's, there's no way we don't go back there. It's right. way too cool a place to shoot. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree because I need to go there. So. Oh, you haven't been yet? Not yet. Oh, Not you yet. gotta get there. Yeah, I gotta no, spend you're... more time in California. I spent so much yeah. time in Utah. <laughs> We're gonna push yeah. you further west. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It's funny. Now, they, some of the comments that we got uh, lead to your next suggestion, okay. which is lighting the clouds. Mm. Yeah. So we talked about that a little bit already, and. Um, uh, so the, the photo I showed um, is of the, uh, the Highland Lighthouse in Cape Cod. Uh, and this was, a, on, this was the last night of the workshop that we did there about a year ago. And uh, again, you know, some clouds, we had had a nice starry week, but some clouds rolled in at the end. Um, but they were pretty low clouds, and uh, they picked up the light from Provincetown, which is, I don't know, maybe, maybe only about 20 minutes away. And 
um, it just created this really sort of surreal background. Um, now, this photo would have worked fine against the starry sky. I'm not saying it, it wouldn't have, but um, if there wasn't the, the town nearby, then these clouds might not have been good to work with at all. They, they could have created a, a dead sky. Yeah. Um, but because there was a town nearby and there was light pollution, um, the clouds picked up all that light and provided this really nice background for doing something interesting with. Love it. Perfect. Perfect. So let's see if I, I think I have one more to, Oh, we have, <laughs> there's a lot of support for Burrito Springs out there. We'll, we'll come back to that. <laughs> We we will go, we will I go. Think, uh, you know I we've done so. that. We I think the first time we did that trip it was just us, and then we did it uh, three or four times with Atlas Obscura. Um, you know, so we might do it with Atlas again. We might do it ourselves again. But either way, I'd say ninety nine percent we we go back right. there. Nice, yeah. nice. Your next suggestion is near and dear to my heart. Go surreal. Yep. Yep. Um, so this is a, a photo, you know, that you and I and Lance were talking about doing these blog posts uh, and Tim too, um, uh, about light pollution. We've been, this has been on our radar for probably all year. Right. Um, I'm going to guess it was sometime last winter that we first talked about doing these. And, uh, you know, so this had been planned for a while and I knew I was going to be writing this thing about using light pollution creatively. And then, Tim popped up with this photo uh, for a blog post that he wrote at the end of the summer. And it was just perfect, you know? Um, and I looked through my catalog and I couldn't find anything that illustrated this point uh, as well as his photo did. So I just asked him if I, I could use it. And that's just, you know, you can use light pollution to create a really surreal scene, um, you know, because we, we don't see that color sky. You know, right. uh, so this is, you know, there's some fog. Um, this is the light pollution of um, uh, San Francisco. I, I don't know exactly where he was shooting. Uh, but, you know, he did a great job of, of just creating this sort of almost apocalyptic scene and mixing the light painting in there. You know, he's backlighting himself. Um, you know, this was just a, a fantastic photo. Uh, you know, the composition is simple but really strong. Yeah. Um, but it, it wouldn't have been the same without that light polluted sky behind him. Um, yep. You know, he could have done, you know, if he was in a scene without light pollution, he might have been able to reproduce something like this by playing with white balance and stuff, which he's really good at, too. Um, but the important thing to our point here is that he recognized an opportunity. Uh, he yep. had a light polluted sky with fog. And he saw an opportunity to use that creatively and create this really surreal scene. Yeah, the contrasting, using contrasting colors on purpose in this situation is great. Hate the orange? Throw some teal in there. You know? <laughs> People just gobble that right up. It's just a beautiful color combination that we like to see. That's why it's yeah. used in cinema so much. Yeah. So. Beautiful. Wow. Wow. Okay, I gotta stop looking at that because it's so good. <laughs> Next up, seizing the light pollution. Yeah, you know, and this just kind of one of the things I mentioned in the introduction, and I kind of go back to it here is just this idea that um, a, a lot of people, I don't know, we just seem to have this innate belief that uh, in order to maximize our creativity, we need to be in a relaxed situation uh, where we're just kind of free to think and, and all that. But psychologists will tell you that it, it's almost the opposite. That's true. That when you're in a situation where your boundaries are confined, uh, when you're being forced to work um, in a, in a situation you might find stressful uh, that that's when we're our most creative um, because those are the times when we start thinking about solutions that, our, our mind might not otherwise go to. Uh, and that's why this works. And that, that, that's why I, I, I say, you know, if you've got some light pollution problems, go ahead and use the filter. That is, it's a viable solution. Or go ahead and take Lance's suggestions about um, 
about using post-processing to fix it and create a more realistic, natural color to the sky. Um, but you should also have this idea in your toolbox as well, that you can use that light pollution in creative ways uh, to make images that might not have been in your head to begin with. I love it. I love it. I know I keep saying that over and over, but this is just one of my favorite topics. You know, like yeah. it's, uh, oh, it doesn't it. surprise me. You know, and I tell people that on workshops all the time. Um, you know, especially when somebody gets upset about, oh, somebody walks through with a flashlight or a car went by or, or whatever. And I'm like, oh, you, sh you got to shoot with Matt because Matt is the poster child for just, oh, that's cool. Let's see what it looks like. Right. You know, um, you've got such an open mind um, when it comes to shooting. And because of that, you create images that other people don't. Thanks, man. And so do you. So do you. And oh, thanks. And, and this blog post, too, is totally embracing it. <sighs> it's Embracing is a good word. Embracing. Yeah. It's a word that I didn't use in the post, but um, we had is the day, the day after this post ran is when our Colorado workshop started. And uh, in our first meeting with the group, one of the attendees, uh, Brian, came up to me and said, oh, I just read the post and I love the idea of embracing the problems and he actually spent the whole week doing that like he came up to me like four times during the week and said you know i i had your blog post in mind and instead of avoiding this i did this and and all that um so that and, and he used the word embrace and i was like oh oh i wish i thought of that word when i was writing the post because uh, that, that's what it is em em embrace the problem and and see what you can do with it yeah yeah it's good stuff uh, I'm going to take a moment to, to address the, the people watching. Um, if you're watching live, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we appreciate you every time you show up. Uh, and we appreciate you all the time. If you're watching on the replay, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, we love comments. You, you can't participate in the live chat because it's not live anymore. Uh, but you can leave a comment down below. Uh, we, we answer everything. Uh, we want to know what you're thinking. We want to know your questions. So please let them. If you really liked this experience, please hit the like button, the subscribe button, and the dinger. You know, we're, whatever platform you're on, since we're doing this to both Facebook and YouTube, uh, thank you for, for tuning in. And thanks for exploring this opportunity to expand the, the written blog posts that we do uh, via conversation. Uh, we enjoy it, and apparently some of you do too, so it's, it's good. Uh, there's some more. It, it, you guys feel free to leave comments in the live chat right now if you want to. Um, but I, I wanted to, to bring up a couple of more things here. Um, I just, there's a reinforcement that Borrego, you know, is, is really someplace that we need to go back to. Um, and I, I think, I, I think I'm, I'm feeling like, uh, I have to go out there and, and just shoot, you know, and maybe I can't wait for a workshop. And, and of course, the best story of all, we heard that there's orphan tripods out in Borrego, too. <laughs> you never know what you're going to find. It's a great place to find an Acrotech head. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, if you don't know what Matt's talking about, go and uh, read Lance's post from two years ago about how he left his tripod out there and somebody found it and it made its way home. I can go. Oh my gosh! I just found the link. I'm gonna put it. I'm gonna put it in the chat right now so that you guys can. can. Yeah, that's a great. That's a great story. Woo. Um, wow. So, Chris, if you don't mind, extemporaneously, mm -hmm. yeah, can you tell me one story from each of the two workshops that you just went through? Um, yeah, you know, uh, Yellowstone. Um, the first one that jumps to mind is one that might actually end up being a blog post um, where we um, we were out shooting on um, Firehole Lake Drive, which has uh, two of the best geysers to shoot in the park. One of them is Great Fountain Geyser, which only erupts, you know, like once every 16 hours, give or take six hours or something. I mean, it's like, you know, it's really hard to time it to shoot, but it doesn't matter because it's beautiful. It's this really big pool that floods and you can get reflections. And the steam mm. coming out. So even if it's not erupting, it's still a beautiful spot to shoot. And right down the road from that is 
white dome geyser, which is one of my favorite geysers to shoot because there's a big mound that rises out of the ground. So it has an aesthetic quality to it. You know, like a lot of geysers are just a hole in the ground. Um, but this has a nice big dome. Um, and it erupts like every 30 to 50 minutes. Um, so, oh, nice. you know, you if you're trying to nail a particular shot, it's a good geyser to try because you know that it's going to, you know, it, it's not going to take too long to erupt again. So most of the group was at Great Fountain Geyser uh, because we were teaching how to do uh, star circles. Uh, and there's an angle where you can get the North Star right over it. Um, but uh, there was uh, one photographer, James, who's been on a bunch of our workshops. Uh, I had set up a camera at White Dome earlier, and he asked if he could come with me uh, to go fetch it because he wanted to see what it was like up there. So uh, we ended up shooting there together for about 20 minutes. And we were just shooting the, the steam coming out because uh, the, it had just erupted. So we weren't going to hang around for 30 to 50 minutes to see if it erupted again because you don't know what, exactly what is coming. We just wanted to do a quick shot where we were uh, just light painting the steam. And as luck would have it, the next eruption was early. And we had just figured out how to light paint it. And then boom, it erupts wow. again. And so we already knew everything to do. Uh, so we opened the shutter and we got the shot. And he was so excited about it that he went back up the road and showed the rest of the group the photo on the back of his camera. Wow. So then at the end of the night, um, there were about four or five people who, who said, hey, you know, can we try that? And so we said, yeah, all right. You know, it's about midnight. And uh, we go back up to White Dome Geyser. And we said, we've got about five people shooting. And the geyser went off almost right away. And we almost nailed it, except that uh, the Luxleys turned blue right as the eruption happened because like somebody just hit the wrong thing on the, on the composer app and, um, and the blue light just looked awful on it. And we said, all right, you know what? It's only going to be like another 45 minutes. So we'll wait for the next eruption. So we did. And everybody's on board with doing this. Right. And then um, the, I wish I could show the photo. I, I haven't edited it yet, but uh, the way we had it is the Milky way was on the left side of the frame. And the geyser was erupting on the right. And I, literally 10 seconds before the geyser went off again, the wind shifted. And so all the steam from the geyser was blocking the Milky Way. Oh, come on. And, yeah. And now it's like 1.30 in the morning. And we're like, oh, we can't believe we waited. And, <laughs> and you know, it just the wind blew the shot for us. And we're even joking. We're like, well, we're not going to wait around for another one. We waited, we waited around for another one. <laughs> It's funny because about 10 minutes went by and nobody's packing up. And Tim just said, oh, we're waiting for the next one, aren't we? So sure enough, at 2.10 a.m., the geyser goes off again. The lights are all perfect. The wind's going in the right direction. And we got the shot. And, you wow. know, we packed up and left at 2.30 in the morning. But nobody was <laughs> upset, you know, because everybody got the shot they were hoping for. Um, Sounds like, I mean, you know, oh, gosh. They, they, what is the old adage? They don't call it fish it. They call it fishing they call it catching or they don't call it catching they call it fishing yeah sorry i totally botched that <laughs> there's there's some sort of metaphor for night photography in there too yeah well you know i uh the michael reichman uh the founder of luminous landscape uh who passed away a few years ago i remember he had he used to refer to it as uh, uh there being two kinds of photography you're either a hunter or you're a fisher and mm -hmm. the hunter goes out looking for shots and the fisher waits for something to happen and we oh. were totally fishing that night um, what an we interesting insight. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with either approach. You know, yep. uh, they're just two different ways of working. And we were fishing that night, and we, we caught a big one. So, oh. uh, yeah, that could that's, be a blog post at some point. Um, that's a great. And, uh, yeah, let's see. Uh, Colorado. Um, Colorado. Colorado was a great trip. Uh, we, we nailed peak foliage for the Aspens, which, um, you know, we did at Rocky Mountain, too. Um, mm -hmm. in, in 2017 and uh, 2018. That was so amazing. Yeah. yeah, and you know, it's it's so hard to plan a workshop around foliage because, you know, just a little bit of difference of the weather in the summer and now foliage is two weeks later or two weeks earlier. And um, we, we were fortunate to really catch it right on time in Colorado. Um, and, you know, it's funny. It's hard to pick one moment in a Colorado because the, the whole trip was just really interesting. Um, like I said earlier, we had... Perfect night skies every night. I mean, it was clear. There was a little bit of uh, smoke uh, from the wildfires out west, but nothing that inhibited night photography. 
Uh, we, we did these Jeep rides up and in the mountains um, uh, that were incredible. Uh, you know, just driving through the mountains at night in these open air Jeeps um, all huddled up because uh, it was pretty cold by then. Um, and I, I guess, you know, there was one night uh, where we, we got out to location right at dusk and the, the clouds were just lit up pink and mm. there were these small ponds uh, sort of in the valleys reflecting the trees and the landscape. And um, it was just a really beautiful moment. You know, it was pre-night shooting, but uh, everybody really appreciated being in uh, such a, a pretty spot, uh, quiet and remote and um, it was just in this amazing light. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's hard to plan moments like that. You can, you can plan to be there, but part of it's luck too. Um, and I guess it's, it's that old adage of, um, success is when opportunity and preparation meet, right? So you prepare to be someplace at the right time, uh, but you need a little luck with, with the weather too. And we certainly had it that evening. Wow. Thanks for those and welcome back home. Thanks. Good to be back for two weeks and then I'm heading to Toronto. Well, you know what? Glad glad that things have uh, become what they are, and that you guys can operate safely and confidently. Uh, it's uh, what a relief! What a relief! Yeah, good yeah. for you guys. Not, not knock on wood. Uh, yeah. You know, we've had to forego a lot of the inside stuff, um, but it's been okay. You know, we're outside and we're doing day trips, and um, you know, kind of traveling in our bubble. Everybody gets yeah. tested for COVID before we leave, and. Yeah. Uh, so it's made for a more comfortable atmosphere, you know, it's, and, um, and it's been good, you know, it's been really good to get outside again and to be able to do it in as safe a way as we can right now. Awesome. Good on you, man. Uh, we don't have any additional comments. Um, so I just want to say thank you to everybody for tuning in again. We appreciate you. Uh, you guys are awesome. You're a Tuesday night crowd. We did have... Oh, gosh, we had this one comment, which I guess I'll, I'll lead out on. Thanks. Oh. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have, um, I think we're taking a break from Instagram uh, conversations, and band conversations this week. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you guys have your Wednesday slash Thursday night free, I would suggest grabbing your camera, you know, go outside, take some pictures, you know. Uh, we'd love to see what you guys do. Uh, yeah. uh, Mars is at uh, very close to opposition right now, so very apparent in the night sky. That could be something uh, fun to go catch. Right. And it's kind of the last licks of the Milky Way for 2020. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Well, that's good. I'm I'm going to do a little like uh, vacationing out in the, the Adirondacks this weekend. So, nice. yeah, I'm going to get out and you know see the mountains a little bit. So okay. I did get to see, oh gosh, I got to see, I, I I guess you guys might see that closer to, to Halloween. Um, but I did get to go down to sleepy hollow, um, and, and make some photographs of the headless horseman early in October. And it was, it was the night where there was a conjunction of Mars with the moon. So I got, nice. I think two really killer shots where we light painted. We actually, we just lit up the, the headless horseman and, and did a nice portrait of him and got those two things in the same frame so I'll share that with you guys that's great yeah well thanks again chris thanks for writing this thanks for sharing your stories thanks matt and thanks everybody for watching all right we'll see you guys uh on the blog uh be sure to subscribe you know to the blog to the everything we thank you we don't need to beat a dead horse we will see you next time seize the night that was a sleepy hollow joke oh did i miss it yeah, beat a dead horse. Oh. You All know, right, it was right. the guy that was dead, not the horse. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, okay. Last story. I live in Catskill. the uh, The other famous story that Washington Irving wrote was about Rip Van Winkle. That's my town. Sleepy Hollow, Headless Horseman, all that stuff. You know. Anyway, it's all Hudson Valley. It's rich with like stories and history and. They were steeping in it. All right. Have a great night, everybody. Good night. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> <laughs>